Good morning. Um, today I'm uh, going to continue on with reading from this book. Uh, this is Dr. Murray Stein's book, Jung's Map of the Soul Persona by Murray Stein. And this book is the basis of the recent album by BTS called Map of the Soul Persona. Uh, the album dropped last Friday, and within four hours, it was number one in 70 countries, seven zero countries. And so the BTS fan group is already quite large around the world, about 80 million people, as I understand it. And uh, good morning, Auto Alchemy. And so um, uh, many of those people don't have access to this book immediately. So what I'm trying to do is to provide first access to this book in little pieces. Um, I won't read the whole book because you really need to buy that, and it's available in many different languages. I'm not aware if it's available in Korean yet, but it probably will be. And um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to read a small portion of this book, and then... Um, I'll be available for comments and extraneous, extemporaneous conversation about Jungian psychology. And I have about two hours allocated to this. I've been doing a talk uh, every morning at 10 a.m., and this is intended for beginners. If you're an intermediate, uh, you may want to pay attention to our Monday evening session, which is at 8 p.m. Uh, Eastern time in the U.S. and every Monday night. And if you're advanced, you may want to join our advanced reading group, which meets every Wednesday at 1.30 p.m. U.S. Eastern time. And that time is intentionally to support also our members in Europe. And the advanced reading group material is available on Dropbox, but only to members of the advanced reading group. And uh, if you wish to join our advanced reading group, please send me an email to skip.conover at gmail.com, and I'll put you in touch. Now, I have done this work as a labor of love, and it has cost me money to do it. I haven't made any money doing it. And I've created over 915 videos at this point to try to help people understand Dr. Jung's psychology. Uh, so if you feel so motivated, please feel free to uh, support this activity on Patreon uh, or uh, be a PayPal or be a uh, the super chat dollar sign that's under when it's on live stream, you can actually make a contribute contribution live through YouTube. And so uh, all those contributions help. I live on uh, my social security and a very small pension from uh, my time in the U S Marine Corps. And so I would very much uh, appreciate your support. And uh, my wife is employed, but she's about to retire also. And so uh, we support, we've been supporting this activity for three years uh, entirely ourselves. And so any help you can give us would be great. Okay. So today I'm going to um, continue with this subtitle in Dr. Um, Stein's book entitled The Way to the Deep, Deep Interior. And so I began that yesterday. You'll find that in yesterday's video. And um, and so I'll, I'll just uh, finish with, or I'll begin with one paragraph that finishes uh, yesterday's, just uh, so that you're you see the connection between yesterday's reading and today. Uh, I'll read this section and then I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. 
Uh, Jung says further in this passage, quote, one man will not allow himself to be disturbed in the slightest by his inner processes. Another man is just as completely at their mercy. A vaguely unpleasant sensation puts the idea into his head that he is suffering from a secret disease. A dream fills him with a gloomy foreboding. One man takes them as physiological. Another attributes them to behavior of his neighbors. Another finds in them a religious revelation. Thus, Jung concludes, the inner attitude is correlated with just as definite a functional complex as the outer attitude. People who, it would seem, entirely overlook their inner psychic processes no more lack a typical inner attitude than the people who constantly overlook the outer object and the reality of the facts lack and the reality of the facts lack a typical outer one. Okay, now beginning on. The above summarizes Jung's structural de definition of the anima animus as he presented it in 1921 in Psychological Types. The anima animus is an attitude that governs one's relationship to the inner world of the unconscious. Imagination, subjective impressions, ideas, moods, and emotions. So far, this says nothing whatever about content of this structure, nor about gender. The usual shorthand definition is that the anima is the inner feminine for a man, and the animus is the inner masculine for a woman. But one can also simply speak of them as functional structures that serve a specific purpose in relation to the ego. A psychic structure, the anima animus, is the instrument by which men and women enter into the enter into and adjust to the deeper parts of the psychology of their psychological natures. As the persona faces out into the social world and assists with necessary external adaptations, so the anima animus faces inward to the inner world of the psyche and helps a person to adapt to the demands and requirements of intuitive thoughts, feelings, images, and emotions that confront the ego. You know, before I go on, I just, if I have it right here, I'll share again. Okay. I seem to have buried what I want, so I'm not going to uh, yesterday, I shared with you a, a diagram of the structure of the psyche. And what it shows is the ego in a circle at the top, the shadow coming down from it, and then this much larger circle, which is the self, and sort of riding on the top of the self, like contact lenses, are the anima animus. And so that's the structure we're talking about. And that structure uh, has nothing to do with persona, which is the equivalent of anima animus, but facing outward into the world. <clears throat> For instance, a man who is frequently moody is said to have an anima problem. He is in the anima today, one might say to a friend. His anima, instead of helping to manage emotions, releases a mood that seeps like a gas into ego consciousness and carries with it in suspension, so to speak, a lot of raw and undifferentiated effect. Now, effect is like emotion. It's A-F-F-E-C-T, not effect, affect. Um, so a lot of raw and undifferentiated effect. This has been known to interfere with ego functioning, to say the least. This man's ego becomes identified with the anima personality, which is, as a rule, hypersensitive and soggy with emotionality. His anima is not highly developed, and instead of helping him to cope with an overwhelming mood, it draws him deeper into it. A man given, a man given to frequent and intense moodiness has too close a relation with this usually inferior part of his personality. 
Of course, if he is a poet like Rilke, who had an anima problem of the first order, he can use this relation creatively, but he may be only uncommonly emotional and overreactive to slights and minor annoyances and injuries and therefore psychologically dysfunctional. His relationships typically are fraught with conflict because he has emotional reactions that are too powerful for him to manage. The anima overwhelms him rather than helps him. Now, I want to come back to this issue of uh, inferior and dominant in a while, but similarly, a woman with an animus problem is also overcome by her unconscious typically by emotionally charged thoughts and opinions which control her, which control her more than she controls them. This is not very different from the anima possessed man, only the accent tends to be more intellectual on the woman's side. These, auto, these autonomous ideas and opinions end up disturbing her adaptation to the world because they're delivered with the emotional energy of a bully. Often they wreak havoc on her relationships because the people near her must build self-protective shields around themselves when they are with her. They feel on the defensive and uncomfortable in her presence, hard as she may want to be receptive and intimate. She cannot because her ego she cannot because her ego is subject to these invasions of disruptive energies. That transform, that transform her into anything but the kinder, gentler person she would like to be. Instead, she is abrasive and gripped by unconscious strivings for control and power. This is what Jung called animus possession. The animus is a powerful, the animus is a powerful personality that is not congruent with the ego or the desired persona. It is other. Men in the grip of the anima tend to withdraw into hurt feelings. Women in, the women in the grip of animus tend to attack. This is convi This is a conventional distinction between the genders, and of course, it is subject to revision in light of recent cultural developments. In both cases, however, whatever the content of the possession happens to be, the inner world of the unconscious is not sufficiently held in check, and emotional and irrational neediness disturbs and distorts normal relations with other people and with life in general. Anima animus possession throws the gates of the unconscious wide open and lets in practically everything that has enough energy to come through. Moods and whims sweep in and carry one away. Impulse control is minimal. There is no containment of thought or effect. This is an ego problem too, of course, symptomatic of an undeveloped ego that cannot hold and contain the contents that normally float into consciousness but need to be reflected upon and digested before being carried into verbal or physical action. But there is also the problem of too little development in the anima animus structure. This lack of development is like an undeveloped muscle. It is too flabby and inadequate to do its job when called upon. Men will then typically look for a woman to help him to help them manage their emotions, and women will typically find a man who can receive their inspired thoughts and do something with them. Thus, other people enter the game of ego anima animus relations. For the sake of discussion, let me describe an ideal psychological development, highly theoretical and improbable as this may be. The conscious and unconscious parts of the psychic system work together in a balanced and harmonious interplay, and this takes place in part between the anima animus and the persona. Here the ego is not flooded by material from without or within, but is rather facilitated and protected by these structures. 
and life energy, libido, flows in a progressive movement into adaptation to the tasks and demands of life. This is a picture of healthy, highly functioning personality with access to inner resources and skilled at outer adjustment. The attitude toward the outer world is balanced and it is complemented by an attitude toward the inner world within. Neither is out of joint or inadequately developed. The persona is able to adapt to the demands of life and to manage stable relations with the surrounding social and natural worlds. Internally, there is well-managed and steady access to a wellspring of energy and creative inspiration. Outer and inner adaptations are adequate to the demands of life. Why isn't life more like this? Actually, many people experience something like this from time to time in their lives. These are the good periods of work and love. But these are often relatively short-lived interludes in a much more conflict-written picture. One large reason for this is that we develop unevenly and very little attention is paid in our contemporary culture to true inner development, to what Jung called individual culture as opposed to collective, persona-based culture. Inside, most of us are extremely primitive. It is only when the persona is stripped away and the anima animus opens the gates to the deeper layers of the unconscious, when, as at midlife, for example, the ego is torn by conflict between persona and animus or anima. That the need for inner development becomes an acute issue and is taken seriously. While this may look like an outbreak of neurosis, it may, may well be the call for further individuation and the challenge to take deeper journey and the challenge to take a deeper journey into the interior on the road toward individual development. Now, yesterday we were talking in part about the shadow and uh, in here, uh, Dr. Stein was talking about <coughs> inferior. And so uh, remember in Jungian psychology, we're, we're always thinking in terms of the opposites and what has to be done with those. And um, so in the opposites, uh, let's suppose that you're extroverted or introverted. If you if you tend to be more on the extroverted side, then you go to a party and and you're very happy in a group yucking it up. And if you're very introverted, you're happy to be over in the corner talking to one person. That's the way I am. Uh, but we're all somewhere on that scale. And under certain circumstances, we become... Um, more one thing than the other, depending on how we have to adapt. So I've talked about in the past the fact that when I put a Marine Corps uniform on, then I tend to be much more, have this persona of a Marine Corps officer. But when I take my uniform off, then I'm more like what my natural dominant psyche is. And um, so the persona of a Marine Corps uh, officer is sensing, judging, uh, pers uh, thinking, sensing, thinking, judging, whereas my natural way is intuitive thinking, perceiving. And so I can put on that persona when I put on my uniform. Now, um, anyway, we have all in all opposites, we have a dominant side and an inferior side. So my inferior side is sensing. So I sometimes miss detailed facts, but uh, I only need a few little facts in order to make an assumption about the world, whereas a sensing person gets all the facts, but they can't make an assumption as easily that goes out and has worldwide implications. And uh, so that, so sensing for me is my inferior side. So that means also it's my shadow. And so whatever it is, when, when 
you have an anima, and I have a very strong anima, uh, the animus side of the equation is still there in all men, um, but it's inferior uh, because normally men have an anima, and anima means, in one way, it means that which animates or brings us out into the world. So um, for a young man, um, seeing the right beautiful woman, the woman that a young woman who is maybe between 15 and 25, let's say, and who is playing through the Aphrodite archetype. Uh, she's quite beautiful. Um, the traditional picture of Aphrodite is, is the goddess coming out of the sea naked. And, um, and so that draws the attention of the young man, the archetypal attention. And, um, and so it's, you know, then the young man is drawn into life by the anima projection onto this young woman. And so that which animates. And so in shadow, all of our dominant sides are the inferior side of all our dominance is present. And we need those. We need them um, for uh, psychic energy because that's where psychic energy resides. It, it zings back and forth in our psyches. And so sometimes we need to control that. So, um, you know, I'm 72 years old, but, but I can still look at a woman and be attracted to, to her, especially if she meets the image of my anima. And, and even though that's now inferior more inferior because I'm not looking for a mate anymore. Still, it's there and it's always there and it's never going to go away. Uh, but, you know, that's what gives life its pizzazz. That's what uh, gives us uh, viva la difference, that sort of thing. So, um, so when we talk about shadow, we're also talking about the inferior side of all these opposites. And there's thousands of them that impact us at various points. And one problem that we have in society is that we have tended to um, pile up opposites on one side or the other. And so uh, the standard one is good and evil, the tree of good and evil. Um, and then we put masculine and feminine because the feminine um, Eve gave the apple to Adam and draw, drew him in to consciousness about the truth of good and evil. And so she's put in the, that basket with evil. So masculine and feminine, good and evil. We have good and masculine, uh, evil and feminine. But that's not a valid uh, comparison at all. Uh, those are uh, those are opposites, and they don't belong piled up in the same basket as feminine. And saying, "Well, then all women are evil." That that's ridiculous. And yet we still have, you know, professional psychologists like. Uh, Jordan Peterson, who wants to go around and talk about uh, all these things being feminine and suggesting that they're all in this basket with evil, and therefore uh, we can't, uh, you know, that therefore masculine, the hierarchy, the patriarchy has to be always in control. Well, that's uh, baloney. Okay, that's just baloney. And um, what we have to start thinking about in our lives is the idea that the opposites are present and they don't necessarily, we don't necessarily have to put them all in the same basket as we have done politically. So now we have this huge neurosis in our uh, national structure in the United States where 
blue is this and e and red is that and just because because uh, such and such is um, blue or red, it's masculine or feminine. That that's complete hogwash. Okay, um, and so when uh, the the red states want to say, "Oh, I'm so masculine," and the and uh, you know we have plenty of masculine uh, Democrats also in the United States, and they're all Americans, and so we have to get ourselves out of this trap, this mindset trap of putting every issue into a basket on one side or the other so that they, they're, it's like it's a scale or something. And because one issue is in this basket and that this basket gets categorized as feminine, therefore it's bad, that's total baloney. Okay, that's that's baloney, and we need to get out of that mindset and recognize that all Americans are Americans, and we have to start listening to one another about what the issues are and decide what's best for our country. But we have now in Congress, we have everyone afraid to go against their own their own political party because then they're going to get attacked if they say anything wrong. You know, that's baloney. And we have to talk about these issues. We have to listen to one another. So now I'll go back. Nora says, thank you for explaining this. Really helped me understand something that's, some things that are happening to me. I appreciate that. I'm glad that that helped. Art, uh, you can talk more about the shadow I've done what I can do today. I'm not going to go into it much more than that. But basically, what I'm saying is, yes, in the shadow, there is evil. Uh, but also in the shadow, there are good things. And sometimes, um, you know, sometimes they add to the pizzazz of life. Like as a 72 year old man, I can still look at a woman and find her attractive and appreciate her as a woman. And sort of imagine what she might have been like as Aphrodite. <laughs> and and uh, that gives me a spice in my life. That's uh, uh, viva la difference. And if we didn't have that, if, if I didn't have that in my life and you all didn't have it in your life for the uh, opposite sex or for, for the other side, um, you know, life would get really boring. And so, so we have to recognize that in, in the shadow, there's, there's spice, there's the spice of life for one thing, uh, but there's also evil. And so um, what comes up from our unconscious is both good and evil. That's the knowledge of good and evil. And, um, you know, even Jesus said, as reported in first John, in the first letter of John near the end of the Bible, uh, verse 4 1 we have to test the spirits and we have to have enough consciousness and ego to decide what is appropriate to be brought into society and what is part of the spice of life and should be left out of society or evil and should be left out of society and um you know so so the shadow isn't necessarily always evil, but it, you know, it is something that you have to examine and decide what is appropriate for civilization and what is not, what is best kept private to oneself. And my point is that anytime there's something um, bad or inappropriate that comes up, it gets pounded out of the system. And the United States is actually the best example of that. And people around the world don't understand our debates because they say, oh, how can you live like that? But that's how we've made the United States the strong country that it is. It's a process like tempering steel and it's pounding impurities out of the system. So we have people from every national group ethnic group, racial group, religious group in the world. They're all Americans. And they've all come here 
uh, trying to find a better life, including my ancestors, and oh, by the way, also including Native Americans, because there were no human beings in the Americas before, well, opinions differ between 13,000 years ago and 35,000 years ago. Before that, everybody was in Eurasia or Africa, or the, the uh, African, or the Arabian Peninsula. And so gradually they migrated up through uh, the Bering Strait land bridge. But even that was human beings looking for a better life. And so it's not that um, Native Americans are that different from other Americans. They, their ancestors just moved earlier to find a better life but we all moved to find a better life. And so the advantage in the United States is every time a good idea gets adopted or gets brought up, an idea like Starbucks, then everybody adopts it. And not only do they adopt it in the US, they adopt it around the world. So um, for example, Starbucks um, came up, it was adopted everywhere. And, you know, I can tell you from personal experience that there are four, four Starbucks cafes in the King Faisal Hospital in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. And that's the case, regardless of fact, of the fact that the chairman of Starbucks is a known Zionist, as I understand it. And so even though that's true, these four cafes, which are coffee shops, are are in the capital of Saudi Arabia. Okay, so so that's a good idea that everybody adopted around the world. And I've found Starbucks everywhere. And oh, by the way, when I went to Tiananmen Square for the first time, what do I see? Uh, golden arches on the edge of Tiananmen Square in, in Beijing. And, uh, but bad ideas, when they come up in our collective life in the United States, they get pounded out of the system by our vigorous debate. And sometimes that's become violent. It became violent during the Civil War when uh, people were fighting about slavery and their economic future. Um, but mostly we have done it um, peacefully. And so, and our vigorous debate, which you see on the cable news channels every single night, is the process of purifying our way of thinking about ourselves and the world. Most other countries don't have that debate, and so they will allow a toxic idea to remain much longer than it probably should have. And uh, But my point is, that everything that you can see in your room um, was the product of a decision about what's good. And uh, if because if it was bad, it would be pushed out of the system uh, very quickly. And uh, there's a, certainly a place for logos, okay, for logos, because we have to have logos and rationality 100% when we're um, making an iPhone or when we're making an automobile, it has to be 100% perfect. And so, um, you know, many men seek perfection and, and it's typically been, this logos idea has typically been on the masculine side, but the point is it's logos, it's, there's nothing, uh, actually male about it. It's, it's simply that um, in the logos is perfection and the word. And so if you go into a Toyota manufacturing plant, there'll be lots of words in books that tell you exactly how to make a Toyota automobile. And you may not deviate from that because if you deviate from it, then you're making an Im imperfect product. Okay. But Producing products doesn't create life. It's we that create life. And that's on the other side. That's the Eros side. And that's the living side. And so uh, when 
when Notre Dame was built 800 years ago, it had to be perfect. And the thinking, the architectural thinking that put that building together at that time had to be pretty perfect in order for that building to stand for 800 years. And, but that building would just be a, a pile of rock if it weren't for the fact that, that religious figures put life into that building for the last 800 years. And so that life is um, essential. Otherwise the building would just be a pile of rock. And so that's the arrow side of life. Uh, and so we all have to understand that getting a thing like, getting a Mercedes in our driveway or getting a, a yacht or something like that, you can buy that yacht, but until you put life into it, it's not going to make you happy. Okay. And our president is a perfect example of that. He's basically gotten materially everything that one could imagine wanting in life. Uh, and uh, and a lot more to boot. And so he's got this tower in uh, Manhattan and he's got other towers and golf courses, you name it, around the world. But is he happy? Okay, I don't think there's anybody, including him, that can convince me that he's happy today. And so that's logos taken to the extreme. And we have to understand that. So um, now I'll go over and take a look here. Uh, Joseph Campbell says, it should be noted that it's not good to project your anima animus to a physical form because your projection leads to wish fulfillments that are not within yourself. Um, right, but that's uncontrollable because it happens from the unconscious and we inevitably project our anima and animus outward. And the question is being conscious enough of it so that we know it's happening. And so, as I've said many times, um, if a woman more or less manage, manages to look something like what my mother looked like when she was 18 years old with long brown hair, and I've shown that picture numerous times, um, my animus says, that's the woman for you. And, you know, the, the issue is that in the outside world, and so that's a projection that happens. I have no control over that. But when it happens, at least I can know that it's happening. And then I can know that that's uh, going to lead me into disaster if I let it, which I don't let it. Um, but that's consciousness. Unlike our vice president, who's afraid to sit down with a woman, another woman, because he, the only way he can keep control of his instincts is if uh, he stays with his wife and never sits down next to another woman. Well, okay, that's a person that's not very much in control of his instincts. That's what that says. And I don't know if we want that person as the vice president of the United States. Um, and so, um, yes, it can lead to a wish fulfillment and it has done for me because mind you, um, I was with my first wife for 17 years. I never had an intention of divorcing her, but one time when this anima came up, uh, it did cause me to take action in the physical world. And that resulted in my divorce and my marriage to my second wife. And now I've been married. I've been with my second wife for over 35 years. And, um, you know, is my life better for it? Yes, it is. But it, my life would have been different if I had stayed with my ex-wife. And the problem was that we did not have enough education about psychology um, to understand what was happening to us. And so I had certain needs that I needed to have normally fulfilled by my wife. And my wife had certain needs that, that she thought she needed to have 
uh, fulfilled. And so she wanted me to be like her father, and I wasn't like her father very much. Um, you know, for example, he loved to go out and ride in his lawnmower cutting grass, and I'm allergic to everything that's green and grows. And so I detest mowing the lawn, but he loved it. And so, so I couldn't live up to that standard. Uh, and by the same token, I didn't understand psychologically how I could move my ex-wife, help her transform to understand how to have a mature relationship with her husband. And so for lack of that knowledge, uh, that caused our marriage to collapse. And, um, and so I've had a happy life, a very exciting, interesting life since that time. But one of the reasons I've been doing this study and presenting these videos is to help people understand their own psychology a little bit. And that's uh, what I'm saying. And so, you know, um, so Joseph, when you say it's not good to project your anima, you're going to project your anima or animus. And the question is how to become conscious so you know what it is and you can make a conscious decision about what's right and what's wrong in civilized society so that when you're building your life, you're going to build it based on a strong foundation rather than a weak one. Joseph Campbell, um, thank you for your super chat. I appreciate that very much. Um, and perhaps you want to consider joining our advanced reading group. Um, and uh, you can send me an email on that later. Um, I've got strength. Says, so when middle-aged people suddenly want to cheat, on their spouses, it's their anima or animus acting up in the process of individuation. I would say there's a, there's a lot of truth to that uh, because for some reason, your spouse hasn't uh, fulfilled something that you're unconscious of. I mean, in fairness, you're unconscious of what your psyche seeks. And uh, suddenly you see that thing in another person and that's very attractive and that can cause a smash up and so um if if you're aware that that process is happening that transformation is happening i think you have a lot more chance of holding your uh, marriage together and also um i think another thing that's very helpful to people is to understand uh, the yin yang principle. Um, and that is that in a marriage, a marriage is a container of a relationship. And in that marriage, there's yin and yang. And, um, and presumably you've married the other person because in some way that other person fulfills needs that you have. And so if we think of the um, Myers-Briggs type indicator, if all four type indicators are the same between uh, a, in a pair, then you're gonna have a very boring life. But if they're all different, if you're opposite on everything, uh, you're going to be in constant conflict. And so you want to have a relationship where, um, two or three of the, of the Myers-Briggs types are the same. And so, uh, right. And so in my case, in the case of my wife and I, my wife is a judging person and I'm a perceiving person. And um, so she wants to make a, a list to go to the grocery store and I just go to the grocery store and go up and down the aisles. You know, it works either way, obviously everybody eats, but you know, I tend to buy the ice cream <laughs> and that's irrational. Uh, but you know, my wife might not put it on the list, but I, but I just pick it off the shelf and say, we're buying this. <laughs> so, so, uh, I mean, that's a, amusing way to talk about it, but, um, but 
that is what it's about. I mean, it's, it's your spouse not fulfilling those needs. And, you know, when my wife and I have a spat, uh, it's typically with, uh, on that plane of judging, perceiving where, uh, she's about to retire from her profession at the hospice. Uh, she works for the hospice and she's about to retire. And so, um, Yesterday, or yesterday morning, uh, I make an omelet for her every day, which I find to be uh, very satisfying for me to make this omelet. And I don't know why, but anyway, I make an omelet for my wife every morning. And so I'm in the process of trying to get all the ingredients together for my omelet. And she so suddenly comes in and wants to talk to me about the tax consequences of her retirement from hospice. Uh, and I'm saying, could we talk about this later, please? <laughs> and so, <laughs> you know, for me, I'm perceiving, I know, okay, I, I'll get to the tax consequences of your retirement, but, you know, I, I, I'm making this omelet right now. <laughs> and so I often mention the mug I have that says, if a man speaks in the, in the woods or in the desert or the woods, and no woman hears him, is he still wrong? And the answer is, yes, he is, because your spouse is the opposite in the yin-yang circle. And so you're only representing half of the partnership, and it's inevitable that there, there are going to be things that aren't going to change. And so, you know, your, your spouse, your husband, or your wife can harangue at you all they want about something that's coming from their side of the equation, but they have to understand that there's the other side too. And just knowing that, it seems to me, allows people uh, to sort of make it a little lighter. I mean, and my wife and I have known about this for more than 30 years. And so, um, you know, when, when she starts to go on about her tax consequences of retirement, I say, you know, that's very J of you. That's very judging of you all well and good, but please uh, leave me alone while I'm making this omelet. And so that's the type of thing that goes on, but it can get out of hand in a couple. And so if you understand what your personality type is and what your spouse's personality type is, then you can work through issues much better, it seems to me. And as I said, it's really not a good idea to find a spouse who has everything the same because then you have a boring life. Then there's no psychic energy pushing you. Uh, and the psychic energy develops between the opposites. But if, if they're all um, different, then you have too much conflict. And so first of all, it's good to understand what your personality types are and then to be able to use those as a entry point to talk about uh, differences, it seems to me. Um, and so let's see, Tin Foil Hat says, uh, I appreciate these videos. I've been looking into Jungian concepts for a few years now. Well, you're certainly welcome, sir. And uh, there's lots to look into here. I think it'll be a long while before anybody looks at every one of my videos. Uh, Joseph says, I disagree. I believe we tend to romanticize a lot in the West. And in turn, we lose a lot of our internal balance. If uh, anima, animus is projected, it will never cease to find more beautiful form. Uh, well, that is true, and I agree with you entirely on that, and I agree with you entirely on the idea that we romanticize. So uh, you can go to a chick flick, for example, and you see all this romanticism in a chick flick where uh, you know, there's, you know, a little bit of conflict, but at the end, the couple always gets together well, and the, and the world doesn't necessarily work that way. And, um, you know, every woman needs to understand that, yes, 
she may be Cinderella for a period of time, but the day after the prince puts the glass slipper on her feet, um, she's going to have to uh, do something different and life is going to change. Life isn't about uh, going to the ball and having the prince come with the glass slipper and say, you're the one. Uh, that's, you know, there, there's an element of that in everybody's life, but after that day, then you have to live the rest of your life and, and we all change over time. And so, um, so we do romanticize too much and we have to be frank in our conversations with one another. And we need to be frank, frankly, going back to elementary school, we have to understand that people are different and we need to uh, learn how to interact with one another. There, there's no doubt about that. Um, and so, um, so I agree with what you said that, um, when you said, I believe we tend to romanticize a lot in the West and in turn, we lose a lot of our internal balance. I agree with that very much. And what I know is that in uh, societies like India, where there's a lot of arranged marriage, uh, those marriages work almost just as well as Western marriages, if not uh, better, uh, because the couple has to get to know one another after their marriage rather than before it. And uh, so there's a more mature approach to uh, the relationship and what the relationship is going to bring to you. So I agree with that point. And uh, if animus, anima, animus is projected, it will never cease to find a more beautiful form. Yes, that's right. I, uh, but at the same time, um, you're never going to, to stop projecting. So you have to understand that and bring it into consciousness and then know how you're going to deal with it. Jerome says, we talked of too much logos. How about too much Eros? Certainly there's too much Eros too. We can't have total irrationality or uh, we wouldn't have any products. We, you can't build a product, um, based on Eros. You have to build a product entirely on logos because the product has to be 100% correct. So uh, the eyeglasses that I'm looking at you right now, these have to be built 100% perfectly and the lens has to be gr ground perfectly for my vision and the frames have to fit my uh, head properly in that sense. And so, you know, we can't just, uh, go out and make eyeglasses out of spaghetti. That's what being too much Eros would do. <laughs> so Peter Pithodinus says, is it not ideal that the Eros and Logos would work together when possible? Obviously they have to, as I said, uh, you can build Notre Dame, but it's just a pile of rocks unless you put life into it. And so, um, you know, we have to, recognize that both of those are needed. Uh, it seems like the struggle may be to balance them in cooperation towards goals. Facts should care about feelings and vice versa, obviously. Um, you know, you wouldn't build a church uh, without understanding that people have uh, a religious archetype, uh, an archetype in the self that wants religion and wants uh, attention to that irrational side of us. So you wouldn't build a church not knowing that there would be a demand for it, because if you build a church and there's no, nobody is going to go to that church, you know, why do it? And so, yes, you have to have a cooperation and an understanding that people need, um, you know, if not, today's organized religions, people need to understand something and have to put life into it. Um, Peter says, feelings should care about facts, absolutely, and vice versa. Joshua, glad I have found you in your channel. May I ask as to how I can start to study Jung independently, i.e. from his own works. Um, what I recommend, 
is start with this book, Man and His Symbols by C.G. Young. He intentionally had this put together for laymen near the end of his life. And he wrote one of the major essays in it. It has four major essays in it. Uh, he wrote one and he completed his contribution only 10 days before his life, uh, before the end of his life. And so obviously he put into it the things that he thought were the most essential for all of us to understand. And um, I often read it, but I will once again read um, one paragraph that I think is so essential for us to understand. And that is on page 101 of the hardbound version. I urge you to find the hardbound version because when you find the hardbound version, you will get the color prints and they're much easier to understand when you see them in color. If you buy the paperback version, uh, the prints are in black and white. But I'll just read this brief paragraph because it's so important. And it's about the importance of each individual. As any change must begin somewhere, it is the single individual who will experience it and carry it through. The change must indeed begin with an individual. It might be any one of us. Nobody can afford to look around and to wait for somebody else to do what he is loath to do himself. But since nobody seems to know what to do, it might be worthwhile for each of us to ask himself whether by any chance his or her unconscious may know something that will help us. Certainly the conscious mind seems unable to do anything useful in this respect. Man today is painfully unaware of the fact that neither his great religions nor his various philosophies seem to provide him with those powerful animating ideas that would give him the security he needs in the face of the present condition of the world. And, um, and so this YouTube channel is my, me as an individual seeing that there is this huge need for psychological understanding. And of course, uh, Dr. Young has talked about that explicitly uh, in this book, Answer to Job by C.G. Young. Um, but, um, you know, I would begin with man and his symbols that will at least get you the basic um, vocabulary of Jungian psychology. And then uh, studying Jungian psychology um, is a, a lifelong process. He wrote for 60 years almost constantly during his waking life. Um, he did build a house with his bare hands during that time, and he had five children. And uh, so he had a, a few other parts of his life. He liked to sail and so on, but he spent a lot of time writing. And for example, there are 100,000 letters of his that still have not been published. And, um, you know, when you think about it, that sounds like a lot. But if you think about the number of emails you send every day, it's just a different technology. And I know that I have on my email uh, backup, I have over 500,000. So um, if anybody wanted to quote me, they would have a lot of work. Uh, and um, so that's where I would start. I would also read uh, the biography of um, Dr. Jung's development of his psyche, uh, which is called Memories, Dreams, Reflections. Uh, and it is available at Barnes and Noble and Amazon everywhere. And there is an excellent reading of Memories, Dreams, Reflections available on audible.com. And I uh, own it in several forms. I listen, I've listened to it probably at least 10 times. And those are excellent starts. But after that, uh, there's really no good place to start. It's like you, you just have to plug in someplace and uh, swim for your life. And, um, and what I find after doing it for 32 years is that whenever 
my psyche is troubled, all I have to do is pick up anything, anything written by C.G. Young, and it calms me down and soothes me immediately. Uh, and so, you know, I consider Dr. Young my shrink, even though I never met him, and he died when I was 15 years old. So, um, so that would be a, a way to start. Um, let's see, where are we here? And Rish Monthretti says, start with Memory Streams Reflection, great book to delve deep in the Jungian psychology. Yep, that's as I said. Uh, thank you. I admit I've started to stockpile Jung, Nietzsche, Milton, Goethe, etc., so then I can spend the next decade, my 20s, sorting this stuff out. Well, you actually don't need to sort this stuff out because Jung. Uh, digested all of that and presents it in a in a more modern way than all those other people so if you know it it's like you know just because there were people that came before doesn't mean that you should waste your time getting a phd and in, in all those writers what you need to do is uh, focus on one and for my lights, that one is young, but you know you you have to make your own judgment. Nietzsche um, is really hard uh, to read because he was um, he was uh, mentally ill, and as um, as Dr. Edinger said about from Jung's point of view, uh, Nietzsche was. Uh, was mentally ill, <laughs> and and um, you know he he died of syphilis, and so um, so we need to um, you know Nietzsche was a brilliant man and he said a lot of truths and so do lots of poets and and novelists and so on uh, and. So hit many of his aphorisms are very good. Thus spake Zarathustra is very powerful, and I found the ending of it quite funny. <laughs> and so, if you want to need, if you want to read any Nietzsche, read Thus spake Zarathustra, and I find it uh, very much easier to read Nietzsche on Audible than I, I can't read him in a book because uh, it gives me a headache, but. In any case, um, you know, and Milton, certainly Goethe, the, you know, there's many others, there's William Blake, and uh, they're all the Jungian authors, Dr. Edinger, Dr. Ann Belford Ulanoff, um, to name a few, and others will, will name others here. And so there are many things to read, and uh, I avoided Jung's own work for many years because I thought it was about clinical psychology and I had uh, no interest in clinical psychology per se. I mean, I don't want to be a psychotherapist and I don't care about the ins and outs about psychotherapy. Uh, but once I started to read Jung, I, I found that he was exactly where I wanted to be because the last 30 years of his life, he was talking about religion and how religion has evolved. Uh, and uh, I've had my own troubles with religion, as some of you may know. And, um, and so I wanted an answer to it and an answer to what's happening to us on a collective level with uh, fundamentalists, both Christian fundamentalists and uh, Muslim fundamentalists. And so I wanted to understand what the psychological aspect of that was. And, uh, you know, I think I'm getting a handle on it now. And, you know, if you want a, a summary of that, let me give you a summary of that. Okay, so here's Dr. Edward Edinger's summary of Jungian psychology from a religious standpoint. And he was the great 
mediator of Jung because he tried to make it more understandable for the rest of us. So if you look at that essay, um, it's actually an interview which I transcribed because I was afraid that the, the video um, that I was transcribing from would disappear and sure enough it did disappear. But here's the link to um, a part of that interview which is the, the guts part of it, the most important part of it that relates to religion. And what Dr. Jung, or I'm sorry, Dr. Edinger pointed out to us that isn't very clear if you're just trying to plow through Jungian psychology and Jung's writings for 30 years is that Dr. Jung cracked through to the source of all religions. And so, and you have to read uh, Dr. Edinger because he's much more, um, or listen to Dr. Edinger presented in that video link that I just gave you because uh, he's much more eloquent and put together than I am on that point. Um, so auto alchemy says, this is one of my favorite topics because there's a lot of disagreement in the typology community. Some people believe the exact type opposite is best and carries the anima animus. Um, yeah, I'm not even going to get into that because there's so many different typings out there too. I mean, Jordan Peterson likes uh, one that talks about openness and, and various other things. And I haven't even looked at that. And I, I'm not saying that he's wrong. I'm only saying that that's another way of looking at things. And, uh, you know, I, if Dr. Jung was doing all this stuff for 60 years, I'm, I'm just scrambling along behind trying to catch up and understand a little bit so that I can interpret it to layman through uh, my activity, which is what this uh, YouTube channel is about. And it is something I can do. It's something that my uh, self forces me to do. It says, this is what you can do and you should do it. And so that's why I've been doing both um, the Archetype and Action website since 2010 and this YouTube channel since, uh, um, since 2016. So let me give you the link to my website also where you will find about 3,500 essays. Um, about 200 of them are mine and they're essays by others. Um, but everything that you find on that website will have been put there by me, essentially. Um, and uh, so Auto Alchemy says, I am ENTP. And even if ISFJs have no letters in common, we value the sense cognitive functions, introverted sensation is appealing to me as an extroverted intuitive. Well, that seems quite right. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm not going to get into the ins and outs of personality because there can be, uh, there are 16 only in the superficial layer of MBTI. But when you consider that everybody is on those four scales someplace and we're always moving on those scales, uh, personality can be millions of things. And so what it is in in an individual case, I couldn't even say. I'm only talking about the really big picture uh, typology when I talk about it. Um, and uh, Auto Alchemy says, not sure where I stand, but food for thought. It's definitely food for thought. And DI3 says, it's hard to say what kind of marriage works best. I wouldn't assume arranged marriages work better or any happier, just my opinion. Uh, have you read anything talking about an over developed animus in women. Uh, well, there, sure, there's lots of literature out there on these that topic. And, you know, I, I agree with you that there's no particular evidence that arranged marriages work better, but there's no 
evidence that they work worse. And I do know um, many people who were uh, brought together by arranged marriage and their uh, marriages have worked very well over decades. So um, it's not a it's not a question of that per se, because, uh, you know, the reality is that even in a so-called love marriage, that's typically based on a pretty superficial layer of projection and uh, which lasts through the honeymoon period. So, so called, you have this projection of this Prince Charming or this beautiful bride. She comes at the wedding, she's wearing a white dress, everything is peachy. And then about uh, six weeks later or eight weeks later, you start to know some of the shadow sides of your partner. And that's when the marriage really begins. And that's when you really start to get to know someone. And, um, you know, so the range marriage simply is starting at that point. There's no, there's no projection involved in the arranged marriage. You're just trying to get to know someone. And it, after two months of marriage, no matter who you are, or how you got together, um, you're trying to get to know your partner and what's going to work best and how you're going to adapt to one another the best. Um, and, um, you know, I, I'm not a, psychotherapist or a mental health professional. So I'm not going to get into the literature of uh, talking about overdeveloped animus. That's, that's for psychologists to deal with and uh, or for mental health professionals to deal with. So it's not for me. Uh, Reshma Thredi says, I am from India and I can say that most of the marriages in India work better than love marriages in the West, mostly because of the cultural upbringing. Uh, and I'm sure there's an element of that, uh, Mr. Reddy. Um, and, um, you know, so I'm not going to argue that point. A nurse says, just realize you are on live today. Sorry, Mr. Skip, it's almost 11 p.m. in Malaysia. Currently, I have to go to sleep, but this topic is quite interesting, and I will watch it this weekend. Uh, well, great, and yes, all my live streams are on replay, so you can go back and listen later. Joseph Campbell, I think without the anima animus in the way you're choosing to see the person for who they truly are, including their shadow, and in turn, relationships last longer because you see their true self. Um, yeah, that's not real easy. And so it's better to be conscious. And, um, you know, inevitably, uh, you do not see the shadow of your partner before you're married because you just don't have close enough relationship with them so that you see the shadow. And um, so, I mean, you know, it's all, all well and good to say you're going to live without anima and animus, but it's way more complicated than just the example I give of, of people, of women looking like my mother. It's way different. It's way more complicated than that. And, you know, Dr. Jung has written a chapter about that in uh, Ion. And I think I read that chapter into the YouTube channel. So you can go listen to my reading of that chapter. I've got strength says it's hard enough to see your own true self. How can you see someone else's true self? Precisely. That's the point. Um, and uh, Joseph says you take away their God image, which is your perception of who you wish that them to be. If you pay attention to your projection and see it as a part of yourself, which is spiritual and could not exist. Um, well, Joseph, you're, you're conflating a whole bunch of Jungian ideas here. And, um, and, and so thinking that 
you can control your unconscious in that way is, uh, I would argue that it's a, a bit of a fool's errand uh, because uh, you can't. Your, your self is the boss, not your ego. And so your self is going to determine what's right and what's wrong, not your ego. Um, and so he says, if you pay attention to your projection, well, if you can be con if you can be conscious of your projections and your projections are for far more than just a love interest. Uh, but if you can do that, that that's going to mean you're going to live a happier life. Uh, but that consciousness, I mean, if you, um, take a position that uh, the red state or the blue state side of our politics is right, then you're projecting something on that side. And if you're not conscious that the other side also has a point, uh, then you're not seeing your shadow either. And, um, you know, we all get what we can get out of our conscious life, uh, but it's quite complicated. I mean, each person has within themselves their psyche, which is uh, every bit as big as the universe that's outside. And um, at best, we can hope to get in our lifetime uh, somewhat of an understanding of what that universe is like in ourselves. Uh, getting to understand that in another person is pretty hard. Um, and I'm not saying it's impossible, but it's pretty hard and it requires a lot of work and a lot of um, truth between uh, the two of you, you know, regardless of gender, regardless of whether it's a friendship or a uh, professional relationship or a marriage. Um, it's just hard to get to know someone else's uh, psyche. Um, and he says, in the human form, it brings a better understanding of things in control that are unconscious within us. Well, that is certainly the purpose here, is to make help make all of us more conscious of what's going on and how our psyche works. And if you can get, if you can grasp a bit of it, then you can start to grasp more and more going forward. But I've been working on Jungian psychology for 32 years, and I can tell you that I'm far from totally understanding my own unconscious completely, very far from that. And, um, and so uh, if, if you think that that's what you're, you're achieving, uh, you know, good luck to you <laughs> is what I can say. <laughs> but, but, you know, excuse me if I'm a little skeptical on that one. Grenade says, is it taboo to divorce in cultures with arranged marriage? Um, well, it certainly is a taboo. Um, everywhere, and it that taboo results in different consequences that I don't really want to address here. Uh, but uh, there are many taboos, and they many of them can uh, cause very sad things uh, to happen in life. And DI3 says, I recently found your channel, and I may go all over the place with questions. Have you discussed introverted intuition ever in your videos? I certainly have. And you can go back to, I think it's the second or third video. Um, understand that there are three playlists on this YouTube channel, which are, I'm going to put them here. JRG1, JRG2, JRG3, and those playlists contain almost everything from the first, second, and third years of this uh, YouTube channel. I'm just completing the third year now. Uh, year four begins June 1st. Um, and, um, 
and so um, in uh, you know there there's there are four lectures at the very beginning of JRG one that did not involve my local group where I'm simply le lecturing to the camera uh, and it wasn't a live stream so there's no chat in it and I'm simply giving you know, basically a lecture. And one of those is about the MBTI. And so you can find that. Um, and introverted intuition is um, something that, that permeates all of Jungian psychology. I mean, you can even find Dr. Jung talking about it on YouTube, um, because among other things, he says, being an introverted intuitive is one of the most interesting lives. Uh, and he was introverted intuitive. And so, uh, so you can hear his own comments about it. I'm introverted intuitive. I have certainly had a very interesting uh, life. Many people think I've had nine lives. Um, and, um, and in truth, that's that's true in many ways. Um, and so, um, uh, you know, it's true because I served to Lieutenant Colonel in the U S Marine Corps. Um, I've been a lawyer for over 40 years, um, almost 45 years. Um, I've been an MBA and in business, I built a business in Japan. I founded a business with two other men that became a public company. Um, and, um, and I've studied Jungian psychology for 32 years. And now I'm presenting uh, videos to the world at large. And so all of those things, and that's only the first things that come to mind. Um, you know, so you, you can have many different lives and, and personas. And I have different personas in each one of those, certainly. Um, and um, Bernard says, the unconscious should be treated as autonomous because we are not conscious of it. It's certainly autonomous. And it's, uh, it's, it's also in charge. I mean, Dr. Jung was very emphatic that um, the self is also called the God image in human psyche. And Dr. Edinger also called it the greater personality. And it's the boss. And so, um, and human beings can't tell the difference between this deepest archetype in the unconscious which can be proven in psychology as a science clinically. Okay, so clinically we can prove that the self is present. Um, and that was proven by Dr. Jung in his time through his um, decades of serving as a clinical psychologist. Um, and Dr. Jung's intuitive point was that human beings can't tell the difference between the God image and the metaphysical God. And uh, the irony is that everything in psychology is metaphysical. Okay, there's nothing that's not metaphysical about the psyche. I mean, otherwise it's brain, it's a bunch of chemicals running around in your brain. And when you see, uh, you, you see documentaries these days that are supposed to be very wise in which they're talking about the brain and how the brain functions. And wow, we put a, we put a MRI on this guy's brain and then watch what happened when he was dreaming. Well, okay. You can see electrical impulses of what was happening when he was dreaming and you can see some chem chemical things happening, but you don't have any clue about what that person was dreaming and what its significance is in his life. Okay. And it, it has a message for him because our unconscious is constantly sending us messages and it sends us those messages through images. This was Dr. Jung's point. And so, um, so 
all these documentaries about the brain and how the psyche works, uh, you know, they are so superficial and they have they haven't come anywhere near um, what the psyche is about. And um, and so, you know, when I see people starting to get into that, I'll be more interested. Um, and uh, and so in any case, it's certainly autonomous and. Um, you know, you can call it the God image, or if you're an atheist, you can call it what you like, but two minutes from me now, you don't know what you will be doing, okay? And what will decide is your unconscious. What I will be saying to you two minutes from now, I haven't the foggiest notion. And when I'm in a live stream like this, I have no idea what I'm saying. It's coming directly from my self from my greater personality because I pull my ego aside and simply respond to you. And, um, and that's the way it works. That's the way creativity works. And so this is my creative activity of presenting this YouTube channel. And, you know, I was noticing in the early days um, that I would finish a two hour session over at Sammy's because the first 70 of our sessions were at Sammy's with our local group. And at the end of the two hours, I, I would not have any clue about what we had just discussed. And the reason was that it was coming from my psyche. And so then later, uh, the next day, I would listen to what happened because I'd have a video of it. And uh, I said, wow, that was pretty good. That's interesting. And so, so then I started to realize what was happening, that, that what, a, what was happening in a conversation. And this happens in all conversations. You know, throughout the Middle East, you see men in tea shops sitting out uh, drinking tea and chatting or playing backgammon or whatever it is. Uh, and all of those are conversations. And we, and that's, we do that all the time in a conversation also. And, you know, women have get together for tea or whatever it is, and uh, they're talking about the men in their lives. And, and it's a way of balancing the psyche because, you know, if you, if you just had to live, if you're a woman and you just have to live with a man, that might, might be very aggravating if, if you didn't have any people to talk about, if you couldn't get it out of your psyche by talking about it with a girlfriend. And the same for men. We talk about women all the time, of course. And, and those conversations are a way of balancing uh, our psyche so that we can cope with our lives and, and cope with the autonomy of our unconscious and our spouse's unconscious. Um, so uh, recently I found out being an INFJ and that explains my entire life basically. Uh, yep, I mean, when you get involved with MBTI and you start to understand these things, then you, it does, um, you know, it sounds true and you start to recognize it. And in fact, um, uh, you know, there's one outfit that used to publish a catalog, but now it's online called, uh, the Sounds True catalog, and basically they were publishing Jungian psychology and, and other topics similar to that. And so when, when you hear things from someone else that you hadn't really thought about, but now all of a sudden you hear somebody else talking about it and you say, aha, now I got it. Um, and so that's what happens with Jungian psychology very frequently. And uh, Mr. Reddy says, uh, Jung in one of his essays says, it must have been God himself who drew to us in this despicable form to know himself. I think we cannot put everything we experience in words. What are your thoughts? Um, well, Dr. Jung uh, stated quite explicitly uh, that um, 
that God was basically unconscious uh, before human beings and that co the consciousness of human beings amounted to um, uh, lighting a candle in in the darkness of mere being. So the point was, the point was that um, he was up on Mount Elgon in Africa and he was looking out over the, uh, the plateau and there were all these herds of different types of animals in front of him. And he realized that God had taken hundreds of millions of years, actually billions of years, to get those animals in all their different flavors to that point. And yet those animals are living entirely on an instinct. And so through evolution, they instinctually were in mere being, but they were not conscious of it. Uh, I mean, there's awareness, okay, awareness, uh, gives you know every living creature some way to respond to situational awareness but to be conscious you need to be able to to bring an idea an abstract abstract idea into mind and um, consider its consequences both forward and back and so on and so um, so God created man uh, so that God could be conscious of his own um, creation. And, um, and the God of um, the God of uh, the book of Job, for example, had uh, both a good side and a bad side. And Job was smart enough to know, that he had to appeal to the good side of God. And, uh, but he never lost faith in the idea of God. He knew that God was there, but he knew that God had a good side and a bad side. And ultimately Job had a vision where God showed Job uh, Le Leviathan and Beth Behemoth. And he's basically showing Job, what it took through all of his unconscious development to get to the point where God could communicate with Job. Um, and so, um, you know, God in Jungian psychology is a very complicated area, uh, which he wrote about for 30 years. So I'm not quite going to try to explain that in 15 minutes here, but um, so in terms of uh, what you're saying, Mr. Reddy, in terms of um, God himself created us in, in this despicable form, um, this form is the best that he could do, okay? <laughs> Think of it that way. And um, you know, at one point, and you can find on the homepage of this um, YouTube channel, one uh, chart where Dr. Jung admitted that for from his point of view, God is the unconscious, okay? And it's not only the unconscious in you, but it is the unconscious, the collective unconscious as well. And let me just... Uh, Okay, it comes from this book, The New God Image by uh, Edward Edinger. And in this book, um, Dr. Edinger published uh, 10, um, I'm sorry, 14 different letters from Dr. Jung talking about God. And one of those letters, it's a letter to the Reverend David Cox, and it's on page uh, 187 of this book, The New God Image by Edward Edinger. Um, and um, Dr. Young is explaining what 
words mean. And keep in mind, Dr. Jung is looking at historical religion from a psychological point of view, but he says, um, he says, please do not think I am stating a truth. I am merely trying to present a hypothesis which might explain the bewildering conclusions resulting from the clash of traditional symbols and psycholog psychological experience. I thought it best to put my cards on the table so that you get a clear picture of my ideas. Although this sounds as if it were a sort of theological speculation, it is really modern man's perplexity expressed in symbolic terms. It is the problem I often, I so often had to deal with in treating the neuroses of intelligent patients. It can be expressed in a more scientific psychological language. For instance, instead of using the term God, you say unconscious. Instead of Christ, self. Instead of incarnation, integration of the unconscious instead of salvation or redemption, individuation, instead of crucifixion or sacrifice on the cross, realization of the four functions or of wholeness. I think it is no disadvantage to religious tradition if we can see how far it coincides with psychological experience. On the contrary, it seems to me a most welcome aid in understanding religious traditions. And that's what I've found. And so, um, and so all those 14 letters I have read into this YouTube channel and that you can find them under a playlist called Blunt Psychiatrist versus Theologians. And this applies to all theologians, not only Christian ones, but uh, certainly all the Abrahamic theologians, including Judaism and Islam, and also Hinduism and Buddhism and so on. All of those things apply. Um, and so, uh, once again, coming back to your comment, um, human consciousness is striking a match in the universe of mere existence. That's what we're talking about here. Uh, Granad says, you should look up Roger Penrose and his theory on consciousness processes. Uh, more on the Logos side, but very interesting in my opinion. Um, well, um, you know, Granad, maybe uh, you ought to do a, a video series on uh, Roger Penrose and help the rest of us uh, to understand it. Uh, you know, time is of the essence. I'm doing everything I can. So I, you know, I appreciate the idea. I don't necessarily guarantee that I can do it, but maybe you can do it. And Brahman says, could you speak on what the psychological meaning of the archon from Gnosticism? I heard the seven classical planets are the archons with Saturn being the chief but are they archetypes but uh, autonomous beings? Um, I think that they were autonomous beings, and uh, I'm sorry I don't have the Archon definition um, in, in my immediate recall. I'd have to look it up, but I, I know that uh, James Hollis, who's a very famous a uh, Jungian analyst, and he's the president of the Jung Society of Washington. <clears throat> James Hollis uses Archon in his uh, in some of his personas that he presents to the world. And uh, <clears throat> the let me talk about the significance of Gnosticism, which is about experience. Now, the Gnostics believe that you could have a direct experience with God, okay, that you didn't need a mediator, namely a priest or a mullah or um, a rabbi or anything like that, that you could have a direct experience with God. And 
the church, of course, was uh, building up a profession of being a priest and being a mediator between God and the people. And so the Gnostics were considered heretics because, uh, you know, if you can have a direct experience with God, then you can know God, then you don't have to believe, then you know. And so that's when you get this wicked little smile from Dr. Jung. You can look it up on YouTube where he says, I have no need to believe, I know. And, um, and you have to, you know, he doesn't want to believe a thing. He wants to know a thing. And one of his fundamental ideas is that you're not going to believe anything about psychology unless you experience it yourself. And so chances are, if you're still here on this conversation, um, you've had some experience and some of the things that I'm saying sound true to you. And so, um, and so you know that it's true, it sounds true, and you have that knowledge. And so on the, on the YouTube video of Dr. Jung saying this, he's asked whether, um, he's asked by uh, John Freeman, who is the man who edited this book. Um, and the reason he was the man who edited this book is because, uh, and I think his name is John Freeman, I'm pretty sure that's his name. Um, but anyway, he um, was asked by Dr. Jung to be the editor, and he doesn't even have a credit here, apparently. Oh yeah, coordinating editor is John Freeman. Okay, so John Freeman was a man who went to Dr. Jung late in his life with interview equipment video interview equipment and he interviewed Dr. Jung for four days and at the end of it Dr. Jung had realized that he wanted Man and His Symbols to be written uh, and he wanted it to be written by the layman so when he spoke to um, John Freeman uh, he knew he was speaking to a layman and he was, knew that he was speaking to a lay audience because he was being interviewed for the BBC. And so after this four day experience, maybe it lasted a week, but it was four days of shoots. Um, he no doubt trusted John Freeman and he intentionally selected him as the coordinating editor of this book because uh, he wanted uh, a layman, not someone who was one of his longtime disciples, uh, to be to determine whether what was being said in the book was understandable to laymen. And that's why John Freeman uh, became the editor of Man and His Symbols. And so in any case, uh, you see the twinkle in Dr. Jung's eye because uh, you know, he's asked, and uh, John Freeman asks him, um, and now do you believe in God? And Dr. Jung gets this twinkle and he says, oh, very complicated. Um, I have no need to believe, I know. And he knew from the, his unconscious, his, his unconscious presented that answer. He just answered, um, intuitively from his self. And so his unconscious knew that that answer was going to put the fox among the chickens. Uh, and, uh, you know, if he had considered his answer, uh, he might, um, he might not have been so frank, but he, uh, he gave his answer. And, you know, he, he got a lot of flack about it, lots of letters written uh, to him. And, um, you know, he, he uh, did a bit of a dance in some of his letters, but his point was he was always, he always was speaking from the point of view of a psychologist and not from the point of a theologian. And he says, I'm only talking about the God image 
which I can point to in the human unconscious. And I know that that's there and I've proven that that's there. I'm not talking about the metaphysical God. And so the funny thing about that, of course, is that everything about psychology, regardless of which psychology you choose, um, everything is metaphysical. And um, so um, that at least that's my observation. And so you have to take what you hear sounds true. If it sounds true, then keep going. If it doesn't sound true to you, then move on. That's fine. Um, and uh, so... And so uh, Mr. Reddy says, you can't put everything we experience into words. And, uh, you know, that's very true. And so um, if you have a religious experience, um, an experience of the metaphysical God, um, then, then you know. And... I've had many such experiences. I have them daily. And, um, and uh, you know, my interaction with BTS over the last few weeks uh, is, is one of those because, um, and it relates to this paragraph that Dr. Jung talked about, about uh, it has to be the individual who decides. And so my God image, myself, has been forcing me to do, to put these essays out since 2010 and to put these videos out. And I've often asked myself, why? Why am I doing this? I'm not being paid for it. Why should I do it? And, but I know it's important. You know, I, I know at some depth that it's important. And one of the things that I was always railing about was the fact that we don't have enough psychological education in our schools so that uh, people understand their own psychology. And then suddenly along comes something that's completely irrational or seemingly irrational, which is uh, a Korean boy band um, whether popular or not, but it so happens that they're one of the most popular groups in the world and may be named as number one by Billboard on May 1st. Um, but one of the most popular Korean boy bands in the world decided to do an album based on Mary Stein's book, which I read at the beginning of this session. I read from at the beginning of this session, this book, which is the basis, Jung's Map of the Soul and Introduction. And so even for Murray Stein, he wrote this book 20 years ago, and suddenly it's a bestseller around the world. Well, guess what? Wow. <laughs> <You know? laughs> That's certainly irrational, and, and certainly um, Murray Stein didn't expect that. And... Um, you know, what I see is now all these young people around the world are getting interested in psychology and union psychology, and they're talking about what all these things mean back and forth. And that's why I started to do a daily uh, live stream to talk about it and to help uh, those young people who are just being introduced to this to help them understand what's happening. And... Um, and there are many people doing it. There are many members of the BTS Army who are talking about the, the uh, symbolism of uh, the various uh, music videos. And they're, they're right on, and they're very interesting. And it's, and it's really, uh, you know, it's, it's a kind of puzzle. It's a complicated puzzle. Uh, like people get interested in puzzles in their house and they do thousand piece puzzles. Well, each new album of BTS, as I understand it, has, has uh, been a puzzle. And so there was, um, there was a album on uh, Ursula Le Guin's uh, story, Leaving Omelas, 
and there was an album on Herman Hesse's novel, uh, Damien, and now there's this album, uh, Map of the Soul Persona, on, uh, on Mary Stein's book about Jung's Map of the Soul. And so these 80 million um, fans around the world are educating themselves. We don't have to get it into the schools anymore because everyone is educating themselves about it. And it won't be for everyone. I mean, we have 17 people online concurrently right now, uh, but some of these videos have had, I, I did a video two weeks ago that's had over 12,000 views and um, over a thousand likes. And I, you know, I put that video online, I think uh, a week ago, Monday morning. And on Tuesday, uh, I was in my doctor's office and I'm looking at my iPhone and suddenly I see from YouTube a message saying, congratulations, you've had your first video uh, that's had more than a thousand likes. And uh, I said, whoa. So I opened my, my um, iPhone and by the time I opened it, and I'm talking about a time of 30 to 40 seconds, um, it was up to 1600 likes. And, you know, obviously that notification from YouTube was probably delayed somewhat, but, um, you know, now it's had over 2,500 likes and this is in a two week period. And so the uh, significance of that is monumental. And, um, and that could never have been predicted. That's what Dr. Jung is talking about in Man and His Symbols when he says, we don't know what to do. And so, Plenty of us that have been involved in uh, Jungian psychology for years have thought about how can we get information out in the general public? And, you know, the, the Jungian analyst community doesn't want to do that because that's their profession. And so they want to keep their secrets and, and um, they don't want you to know because they want you to come and pay $150 an hour for them to analyze you. Uh, you know, which is all well and good. There's nothing wrong with that. That's, that's a mental health profession. But I've been frustrated by the fact that we need this information in the general public in order to help society itself. And I even uh, wrote a book, which is on Amazon called Political Psychology, New Ideas for Activists. And, you know, nobody bought it, um, but it's there. And, um, and I think it's good work, and other unions think it's good work, but uh, <laughs> it's not a bestseller, and, and so now we have this irrational thing where a Korean boy band takes up Jungian psychology, and suddenly we have people all over the world wanting to learn about Jungian psychology, so it's, it's, an act of God. Okay. It's a, it's something that came out of the collective unconscious somehow, and it's changing the way the world is. And you need to go back and look at the, at the BTS performance on SNL, and you will suddenly realize that these young men are going to change attitudes around the world. They already are. They already have among their fan group. And they're only just really beginning, even though they've been, they've made like 10 albums, but uh, most people didn't notice them up until now, but all of a sudden, bango, uh, everybody's noticing. And, uh, and so that's going to change the world. So this is what Dr. Young is talking about. It, you know, it's going to come, a change if it comes is going to come from an individual and it's and it's, you know, we all have to examine ourselves and what we know that can realize this. So I had to do all that work for the last 10 years trying to get all that out so that when BTS came along, I could suddenly see the significance of what they're doing. And it's extremely powerful and it's going to be very powerful around the world. Um, 
Okay, let's see where I am. And so anyway, Brahman, um, Gnosticism was about having a direct experience with God. And um, if you've had that experience, then you know, you don't, you have no need to believe. And, but it does not mean that we're going to turn our back on uh, religions because all religions are grand schemes of um, mental health, basically. And they, they developed um, spontaneously um, in an evolutionary manner and they work. Uh, and they have worked for societies for millennia. And, uh, but now we're going to understand why they work. And oh, by the way, um, every fact in every religion is true. They are psychic facts. And, uh, you know, they're not the same psychic facts, but they are true. And, um, and that doesn't have to do with the, um, the physical world, because as Dr. Young says emphatically in answer to Job, uh, every religious statement of whatever kind is a statement of the psyche. It's not a statement of the physical world. And if that weren't true, uh, they would be covered in the books of natural science, which they are not. And so when Notre Dame burned and um, i I burst into sobbing watching the news and then I did a little video about it on on Monday night and I was sobbing as I was presenting the video. Um, that comes from the irrational side. That comes from something in the very deep unconscious. And if it, if it was rational, you know, my ancestors are in the United States because uh, the Spanish Catholics kept coming to, to the Netherlands uh, every year for 80 years. It was called the 80 Years War, and they were trying to beat the Dutch back into being Catholics. And finally, about halfway through that, my ancestors in 1625 came to New Amsterdam to get away from that war, that religious war between the Catholics and the Protestants. And so by rights, as a as a son of that um, first ancestor in the U.S., and as a Protestant, and as a as a Reformed, as a Calvinist, um, I should say, you know, haha, too bad it was a it was a Catholic church that burned. But and you know, if if I had lived in 1625, I might have thought that. Um, but uh, you know, something in me very deep um, caused my emotional reaction to that. And, um, and so that's not rational. Rational was building up the walls of the cathedral and making it beautiful. But um, the irrational is the life that goes into that cathedral. And obviously a part of my life was tied up with that cathedral. Also, I did visit it many years ago. Um, so, okay, so DI says the best way I can put words in my impressions is using metaphors. And that's, um, you know, that's what poets do. And you know, that's what I've done in my poetry. Um, I've got strength as, says an example of how we can't put all our experience in words. A person asks, what do you like about BTS? Another person replies, everything. There's too much to explain and we can't explain it anyway. Absolutely. Uh, because, um, you know, I, I say everything too. <laughs> and, and, and you know the the it's just hilarious to go back and and watch these guys being introduced there's videos on youtube of guys being introduced to bts for the first time and they're very he-man guys and all of a sudden they're looking at the screen and they're 
they're shocked by what they're seeing because it's coming from the irrational side. It's not coming from the rational side. And, oh, by the way, they find that they like it. They don't know what they like, but they like it. And you you see that light going on in their eyes uh, and in their responses immediately. And so one of them says, uh, uh, well, I'm looking over here at my left brain, my logo side of the brain, and it's empty. I don't see anything there. And that's right, because it's all from the irrational side. It's from the arrow side. And uh, so if you don't believe that's going to change things in the world, it's changing things already. It's, it definitely is. Um, and so I've got strange. So, so that new person wouldn't understand what everything meant but fans understood and just supported silently with likes. Yes, absolutely. And, and now their fans are talking about it, um, you know, and it's like zit, 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 around the world. All of a sudden, everybody's talking about it. Tamara says, it's so amazing the new way the knowledge is spreading. Um, your work is essential, mix, mixing the experience with the enthusiasm across generations. Thank you, Tamara. I, um, I can I see the value of what I'm doing, and I see, um, you know, so that's what it was for. Okay, that's why I did all this work on this channel or on this website, and now over 900 videos on this channel. And I kept asking myself, why am I doing this? Why am I doing this? And all of a sudden BTS comes along and I can say, that's why. Okay, and so there you are. Uh, yeah, it says, it's the hero journey tale phenomena. I haven't seen many things as powerful as speaking to the collective unconscious, absolutely. Um, and I've got strength, there's a press conference with English subtitles on Bangtang TV. They talk about the new album I recommended. I saw that press conference, very good. Uh, Van Gogh says, hello, I've got strength, but they cut out the part when the members explain why that sat, sat on the floor while Halsey was shown on the screen. It's because they worried that the press won't see the subtitles because of them. Uh, very interesting. Um, and uh, that may well be. And they're very smart about their presentation. And, um, and Rushmouth Reddy says, if we describe our unconscious, we're dragging our unconscious into realm of knowledge. I think it is beyond yes and no. That's why it is different and sacred in each one of us. Uh, I think you're right, Mr. Reddy, and you know we will never, we will never totally control or understand our unconscious, even in ourselves. Um, but at least we can have some sense by studying what Dr. Young uh, showed us. We can have some sense of what's going on, and that's what it's about. Now, I am at my two-hour limit. I need to uh, really end this conversation for today, much as I hate ending streams that have people listening. Uh, but uh, I, I am trying to do a stream every morning at 10 a.m. U.S. Eastern Time. And so I will continue on tomorrow. And... Um, and we can continue this conversation if you wish to join. And you're free to write me at skip.conover at gmail.com. Uh, you're free to join our advanced reading group if you wish. And um, also, uh, any contributions you can make to my Patreon page or via PayPal will be very appreciated. Uh, or uh, super chats on live stream. All those things are very helpful in terms of keeping my motivation going. Although my, you know, I'm not saying it, it's not a threat because I know that, you know, myself is going to make me continue to do this for the foreseeable future. So, um, so, but if you 
think you had value out, out of this video, uh, you could buy me a cup of coffee. That would be very nice. And so um, let's see. And so anyway, uh, I'm going to terminate at this point, and there's lots of other things to read, not only on this playlist, which is called BTS Army Support, and there's now about 20 videos on this, um, but, you know, uh, there's plenty to look at on the channel, so I look forward to having your responses on that comments and so on. And I will certainly respond to you. If I see a comment, I will certainly respond. So thank you for joining me today and I'll see you again, maybe tomorrow.